Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started on our next session so that you get to go to lunch before your stomach is growling loudly and drowning out the last speaker. So I'm Jan O'Hara with the Water Board, and I think it's such an honor to be here today at the 25th anniversary of the RMP meetings and to introduce this session, Bay Mar or Moving Up Bay Margins and Watersheds. Just to give a little bit of setting the stage for this session, I want to go through a very brief, like, C student cliff notes version of the RMP's activities regarding PCBs. So as Steve said earlier, in the 1990s, the RMP looked at contaminant concentrations in the main channel, basically the spine of the bay. And in the 2000s, again, cliff notes version, the RMP assisted, its, its studies assisted the water board in developing the PCBs TMDL. In 2010s, the RMP activities moved into a lot of work on helping to estimate loads of PCBs to a bay and um, monitoring tributaries. So the next three speakers are going to show how they're moving up into the watersheds and to the bay margins. Our first speaker is Phil Trowbridge, the manager of the RMP. Uh, he's trained as an engineer, but he really enjoys working with staff and stakeholders to keep the RMP on track and running smoothly. Thank you, Jan. Let's get my slides ready to go. This is it. I'm all set. All right. We Need to go back to me. Okay, so very good. All right, so um, good morning, everyone. I just want to start off by thanking my co-authors, which are uh, uh, Don and Jay and Lester and Scott Dusterhoff at SFEI. Okay, so until recently, uh, the margins was a major gap in the RMP uh, in, in our coverage of the bay. And the reason for this gap had everything to do with the size of the boats that we used to monitor the bay. Uh, we made a decision that operationally, we couldn't get any closer to shore with the boats that we used than areas that were less than one foot below mean tide line, or less between, below the low tide line, or else we risked getting stuck in the mud. So that defined the area of the RMP, which is the area of blue, but it left this gap. Uh, which is the area between the blue and the shoreline, and that is what we're calling the margins, and it's highlighted in yellow. So what started out as a purely operational decision turned out to be pretty significant. In the end, it's about 15% of the total area of the bay. And if you look down in South Bay or Lower South Bay, you see that it can be well over 50% of the total area. So it's, very, it's a very large and important area for us that we were missing. Definitions are a bit abstract, uh, but so what are we really talking about here? And so I think if you want to conceptualize this at all, think of mud flats. Um, you know, these are the areas that are shallow, uh, they're flooded at high tide, but they're exposed at low tide, and our definition at least extends up to the edge of the wetlands. Uh, some of the other groups operating in the region uh, include wetlands in their definition of margins, but for the RMP, we wanted to avoid overlap with any kind of wetlands monitoring programs. All right, so normally I would say, you know, why should you care? Um, but I think the fact is you already do care, and let me tell you why. Um, so first off, the margins is really, a, the most of the, is really the part of the bay that most of us ever interact with. It's where the bike trails are, it's where the, the shoreline parks are, it's where the fishing piers are, it's where, if you're a kiteboarder or, or a, a uh, windsurfer, that's where you are. This is the margins, and so contamination in this area has a direct impact on our lives. Um, margins are where watersheds and loads of contaminants from watersheds enter the bay. Uh, margins are a key location in terms of dredge material reuse within the bay. Margins are where the effects of nutrients in the bay are most keenly felt. Margins are where, if you're a fisherman, is where you mainly catch the fish, uh, if you're a recreational fisherman. And finally, margins are where we generally have our hotspots of contamination that need remediation. All 
Okay, so I, at the beginning I said until recently that margins was a gap. And fortunately we began, we started to fill, fill that gap. Um, that's one of the great things about the RMP. With 25 years, we can, we can correct mistakes. We can figure out how to adjust our program to make sure we're covering everything. And um, what we were able to do was scale back our other monitoring programs so that we could cover the margins in a cost-neutral way. So I'm going to give you a quick top 10 lessons learned so far from our work in the margins. All right, so margins. As it turns out, we can sample them. You know, first we gave up on it because it seemed too difficult. Uh, but it, it's actually, a, because we know that they're so important, we've challenged ourselves to figure out ways to get around this. So first we started using some smaller boats. These were led to some pretty cramped conditions compared to what we're used to working with. But sometimes we even needed smaller boats. <laughs> and that's, you know, even more difficult. Then we switched over, uh, started adopting and using passive samplers, which we could deploy in the margins with one pass and then get representative data for a long period of time. And then finally, we started working with USGS and their flow-through systems on boats so that we could collect data on things like chlorophyll without ever having to stop the boat. And that gave us great access to the margins under the short tide windows we have. So with these tools, uh, we were able to start two field campaigns, uh, one covering Central Bay in 2015 and another one covering South Bay in 2017. And you can see here the points that we've sampled along these shallow margin areas. Um, one of the other things I want to highlight is in the, the lower right corner is this picture of all the sample jars that we collect when we go to these sites. Uh, this isn't one site, it's probably two sites worth of bottles. Uh, but it gives you some idea of the number of samples we collect and the, the variety that we do this because once we get there, we don't want to have to go back. It's a really difficult place to get to and very costly. So we have tons of archives that we can use for additional analyses down the road. In addition to these regional studies, we focused in on a few margin areas, in particular uh, the uh, San Leandro Bay margin area. And uh, Don's and Alicia's talk following me will uh, get into more details about that um, study. And we have a few other areas that we may be doing studies in in the future. We just haven't. Um, implement them yet. Okay, so number four. Margins are more contaminated than the open bay. Okay, so I'm going to admit right now this is kind of a duh uh, finding. I mean, of course, we expected that, right? Uh, but uh, there are some interesting corollaries, and I just want to make sure we, we hit them. So this is interesting. No data. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. How can I do this? Maybe I can... Just go out of presenter mode for a second. Yep. Sorry, we'll make this bigger. Any hope here? I'm not a Mac person. And it clearly didn't help anyway. Um, well, all right, this is not helpful. Um, so we'll just uh, attempt to give you an interpretive dance of what this is. Um, it's coming, don't worry. Okay, so focus on the yellow, uh, focus on the red here. Um, the, along the x-axis was the years. Um, and showing the data for the um, 2012, or 2002 through 2012. And if you could see this, you would see uh, a number of points, low points around this area. And then you would see in 2015, when we sampled the Central Bay margins, a uh, cluster of points that extends all the way up to here. And the important point I was trying to make here is that the, uh, the, cost, the baseline in the margins was about twice as high as in the rest of the bay. Um, that we occasionally hit some hot spots, but the important thing is that we, we've hit a fair number of warm spots. And these areas are you know, about three to five times higher than anything else in the Bay in terms of PCB contamination. And they cover a significant enough, significant enough error, area that they are biologically significant. So one of the things that's a the corollary is that when we reuse dredged material from the open Bay, it's actually 
hard to make things any worse in the margins. And because if you compare the reuse, uh, the thresholds for beneficial reuse, it's about equal to the, um, the concentrations that we have in the margins. Okay, another finding, margins are sensitive to nearby sources. Um, so here's the same data that I was trying to show you before, but as a, as a map. And let me explain the graph here. So it's the data from 2015 margins in the, shown in the yellow circles and the orange circles around the edge. And the data from Central Bay in um, blue and green circles. Um, and the size of the circle is proportional to the concentrations of PCBs found in that sediment sample. Uh, so you can see kind of what I was trying to show before is that the concentrations in, around the margins are higher and more variable than in the open bay. And that the, uh, that there's a, a great deal of, that it's, but it's not a random variability. We see some high concentrations in areas that are closer to sources. So for example, if we compare our data for the central bay to what we know about PCB sources in the watersheds, we can see a few places where they line up. Um, it's not always the case, um, but you see this, this case down here in Brisbane, uh, where we had one of our highest sites corresponding to some of the watersheds that we've monitored for PCB loads to the bay, and um, it's a very good match. Uh, we don't always have a good match. Like up in Richmond, we did not see the same high concentrations um, that we would have expected. But of course, our coverage of samples within the margin is pretty spotty. So I don't think we've really gotten a good representative sample yet. Um, so the good news, though, of this is that if there's, some if there's an explanation or something that can help us understand a problem, it helps us to understand the solution. And so I think these margin sampling is helping us to see those connections, and it's helping us as another way to identify sensitive watersheds that need our attention. OK, so margins are where the wild things are. Uh, for better or worse, this is where a lot of the, the wildlife in the Bay lives. And, and I think importantly, is exposed to contamination in these areas. And this exposure is one of the pathways that uh, gets contamination into the food web. So a good example of this is a study that we conducted in 2010, uh, looking at PCBs and small fish. Uh, it found that the concentration of PCBs in these fish was higher than what we are seeing in the larger fish of the bay. And this ran counter to our expectation that the larger fish would have higher concentrations due to the biomagnification. Uh, so the explanation was that these fish are, the concentration of PCBs in these fish represented the exposures that these small fish were having in the margin area. And so therefore the margins are a significant pathway for getting uh, contamination into the food web of the whole bay. And, but it's not just about fish. There's a lot of different species that live in the margins. And uh, because of the higher levels of exposure in these areas, we often monitor them as our way of testing for or screening for uh, potential issues. Uh, so this afternoon, you'll hear a presentation from Meg about perfluorinated compounds. And she's showed data on seals and shorebirds. Um, also in the afternoon, Morgane will talk about harmful algal blooms, where she'll uh, present some data on mussels. All right, and the number one issue is, okay, margins actually may respond to management actions. Uh, I think we've all, with PCBs, we've always been concerned that it's gonna take a very long time to see a, um, a change in our PCB concentrations in the bay. But margins may be faster than that. So let me just start at the high level, which is we, can, we have some data from cores, uh, sediment cores taken in wetlands near the margins. Uh, that are showing PCB concentrations. So on the, on the x-axis is age, in, and you can see 1940, 80, and 2005. And the y-axis is PCB concentration. So clearly, what we're, we, this area has shown and is responsive to the, the large-scale management actions of phasing in this chemical and phasing it out. So that's probably at, a mo at the growth scale, we're seeing that type of change. But what about uh, more subtle changes in the last 20 years? Um, well, that's another question. Uh, so this data, this graph is showing our PCB data for Central Bay for the last 20 years. And what we're, the, the x-axis runs from deeper areas uh, up to shallower areas. 
And um, so you can see this general pattern where we're seeing higher concentrations in the margins, um, and that was one of the things that led us to, to be interested in them. And when we add the 2015 data onto the, uh, the graph, we don't see much of a difference. Um, so regionally, we're not seeing a pattern yet, um, but we are starting, that's one of the reasons why we focus in on these narrower um, uh, specific margin units like San Leandro Bay and the Emeryville Crescent, uh, for example. So one of the two areas we've looked at is, is um, this small margin area near the Bay Bridge in Emeryville. Uh, here's the Bay Bridge. Um, we haven't done a field study there, but we have been doing a modeling ex exercise and a conceptual model exercise. And we would predict that if we could turn off all of the residual PCB loads into this margin unit, we would cut the uh, inventory of PCBs by 30% in 10 years. Now, compared to we're never going to, you know, it's going to take 100 or 200 years for PCBs to clean up in the bay, that's relatively fast, and that's good news. We don't have a lot of data to verify that, uh, but we do have some data in San Leandro Bay uh, from old data and new data, and that's one of the things that Don will cover in his talk. So a lot of this talk is focused on PCBs, and that's because that's been of great interest to the program. It's been one of our major drivers. Um, However, the RMP really needs to be relevant to new issues. And the discussion at the end of the last session, I was just chomping at the bit to jump in here and say, um, many of these new issues like climate change have everything to do with the margins. And we've been working on this for 15 years. So I think we are taking the right steps. So let me just cover a few of them. Um, so one concern is sea level rise and flooding of contaminated areas on the shore of the bay. And this is a... Um, sea level rise inundation map uh, for Richmond uh, under a two-foot scenario, which is a mid-range scenario for 2050. Um, so the blue, light blue areas and the green areas would show areas that would be underwater at just high tide. It has nothing to do with storm surges right now. It would be much higher under storm surges. And uh, this new island here is a former landfill. So the question would be how, which, uh, you know, how contaminants are going to be released during the sea level rise scenario. And here's one fun fact, which is that 40% of our old industrial area is within one kilometer of the shoreline. Okay, another issue mentioned, people mentioned earlier, uh, Measure AA and the Restoration Authority. Uh, voters passed um, the bill a few years ago. It's allocated $500 million for wetland restoration in the next 20 years. Uh, this will result, if we are able to achieve our goals, a doubling of the rate of wetland creation and restoration in the Bay. And I'd ask you is if you were investing $500 million, which is, I guess, around, um, you know, a lot. Um, if, you, if you're spending that, and one of your goals was to improve water quality, how are you going to monitor that to see if you've actually hit your goal? Or if you've had unintended consequences? Um, following on to that, in order to achieve our restoration goals, um, we're going to need way more sediment. Um, this graph is, is ex comparing the expected amount of sediment we need to get to that 100,000 acre goal versus what we expect to come in from the sources we know about. Um, this is a very rough graph, and it, it doesn't account for sea level rise, which would, would basically double the expected need. So managers are talking about reusing more dredge material or reusing things like biosolids in order to fill the gap. Um, so the question is, you know, what are the long-term impacts to wildlife um, that are exposed to contaminants in these materials that we use for restoration? Um, uh, these stressors present huge challenges to the region and the RMP is not going to solve them all. Um, but the RMP contribution to the solution can be regional monitoring for status and trends, for sediment supply, and for wetlands uh, to help us understand um, our status and uh, the future directions. And but importantly, we have to be ready now to contribute. If we're, gonna, if we're going to contribute this way, we have to be ready now and set up these programs in, to get baseline. OK, so what's the bottom line? Um, you know, I, the RMP resources are limited. And as the manager of the program, I am keenly aware that if I allocate funding to any one thing, I'm taking funding away from something else. 
Uh, so my main objective with this talk has been to give you an update on where we're at with the margins to make sure you understand all the work we've already done, but really also to convince you that it's been a good investment and that we should continue to invest in this area. And it really boils down to two points. Uh, the margins have an outsized impact on the conditions in the Bay. And this is what I've tried to demonstrate with my top five list. And second, the margins are strategically important for us if we want to stay relevant to the management decisions of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. We have a minute or two for questions for Phil alone, if you want to uh, ask anything. Any questions? So well, I guess I just wrapped it all up, right? <laughs> no issues? Yeah. You talked about shutting off the sources in Emeryville. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, what, what kind of sources you were, what kind of sources you meant and what that entailed. Yeah. Sure. So um, I think your mic was on. So it was just saying what kind of sources of PCBs might there be in Emeryville? And, there's some, still some uh, stormwater discharges into that area. Um, and so that's what we were modeling, is if we were able to control uh, some of those through either um, source control or uh, remediation, then we could uh, conceivably see a reduction of PCB loads in the, in the region, or PCB inventory. So I noticed um, on the core data yeah. that I, I think that the more most recent which is the top there was at 2005, and then the next slide you showed 2015 data. Yeah. Is there plans to do some additional coring so we could see in, from the perspective of those cores if there's any additional trends that, out there? Well, I'm gonna ask Don, <laughs> Don to help. So the coring data was Don's work, and, and Don, is there any plan for more coring? Immediately, but I, I could envision it as being part of, um, you know, instead of temporal uh, collection across time, you you might say, okay, 20 years from now, we'll we'll do a, a core just to see if you know we we have a localized effect or something like that. Harry. So you showed that the concentrations of PCBs were high in the shallow margins. Do you have an estimate of the mass? Well, that somewhat depends on this one dimension, which is the vertical dimension, right? So how far down are you going to go? And I think with Emeryville, we, we went down to, what, 10 centimeters? Five centimeters. So, okay, so it's surface layer. Um, so assuming things that are below that are sequestered and essentially not part of the active layer. I mean, certainly for the first round, we did calculate a total inventory. And, and about 20% um, in Central Bay? So there's 5% of the area, four times as high. So it's, it's something about 20% of the total inventory. Right. And that's one of the things. It's, while it's a small area, it's actually, you know, it's about, on average, about four times higher in concentration. So it has a, an outsized impact on the inventory. Okay. I think we're going to let fill up the hook and uh, move along. We will have a chance for more questions after all the speakers have spoken. So next up is Alicia Gill, an environmental scientist at SFBI, where much of her focus is on monitoring pollutant concentrations and loads in stormwater. Uh, she has, is, she's an alum of Davis and Berkeley. <laughs> and she enjoys getting out into wet, muddy storms, so I think we'll hear a little bit about that. Is this on? Can you guys hear me back there? Yeah. Okay, right on. Cool. So Phil talked about the incredible importance of the margins, and the margins are this, this interface between the landscape and the bay. And the group that I'm part of, we work on measuring pollutants that flow off of the 300 plus tributaries directly surrounding the bay. Most of the pollutants flowing into the margins are literally flowing in in stormwater events. We've, uh, we've got a few different monitoring strategies that we use to measure and identify where the pollutants are coming from. And I've got a couple of stories for you about our work in water year 2017, each applying different monitoring uh, strategies. 
oh, there's the stormwater monitoring. So uh, first story, measuring PCB concentrations in watersheds draining to the San Leandro Bay. And I want to have full transparency. The setup to this story is most of the story, um, or the setup to the monitoring is. And that's because it's going to give you a good intro into Don's next presentation. So as Phil mentioned, we're currently uh, working on four studies in certain margin units that we call the priority margin units, and we refer to them as PMUs, John just did, or Don just did. So we're trying to answer this question with these studies. How do the margin areas recover once we reduce or stop the flow of pollutants into them? The answer to this question is intended to provide a foundation for establishing an effective monitoring plan to track responses to those load reductions, um, to help with the planning of management actions, and then also to help um, inform revision of the PCB TMDL whenever that happens. So we began our first PMU study up here in the Emeryville Crescent, as was mentioned earlier. Then we moved to the San Leandro Bay here, um, and we got to do a pretty comprehensive field study there, and there will be more on that later. Um, we are now working on Steinberger Slough, and later we'll move up to the Richmond Harbor. So in building the conceptual model to answer that question, uh, we needed a fair bit of information about the loads of PCBs flowing into the margin areas. And uh, we don't have anything really in San Leandro Bay, or not much, um, but we do have a lot of data that the RMP has amassed over the years um, from which we can infer. So, for example, um, the RMP and other collaborators, some of you in this room, um, we've done some intensive loading studies in eight watersheds around the bay. And these are multi-year studies with continuous flow, turbidity, and rainfall, and we that are complemented with water quality sampling, sampling during storm events. Um, these, uh, this data enabled us to create the wa Regional Watershed Spreadsheet Model, or the RWSM. And um, these data sets, oops, excuse me, this is a simple model to estimate annual time step flows and PCB loads into the margin areas in the bay. Um, this model is going to be publicly available in the first half of 2018. So based on the outputs of the RWSM, we can estimate total annual flow into the San Leandro Bay margin um, from this 83 square kilometer drainage area. And we can estimate total annual PCB loads into this margin area. For the conceptual model, we also wanted to know what proportion of PCBs were flowing in on different grain sizes. And we were able to draw from a study by Yi and McKee back in 2010 to get that information. And using three of our intensive baseline data sets from those eight watersheds, three that most closely mat matched the watershed characteristics of the San Leandro Bay drainages, um, we could estimate the loads of PCBs exported into the bay, into the San Leandro Bay during different size storm events. And um, this type of information is really helpful in the PMU conceptual model um, to understand the fate of PCBs that are flowing into the San Leandro Bay and potentially flowing out of it. So an interesting outcome of this particular analysis was that um, we realized that um, most of the PCB load coming into the San Leandro Bay over the long term is actually coming in on smaller size storm events, so storms that, are, that have the one in one year return or smaller. So we've got a lot of data to help inform the PMU conceptual model, but what we can't do with that data around the rest of the region is help stormwater managers know where exactly they should go in the San Leandro Bay to find sources and get them cleaned up. And of course, if we want to clean up the margins, we got to go find those source uh, properties and get them cleaned up. And I know BASMA, the municipalities, EPA, DTSC, Water Board, a lot of consultants, so many of you in this room are working on that exactly, finding those source properties and getting them cleaned up. Um, you guys are the ones who are going to change the margins, and my hat is off to you. The way that uh, the RMP is supporting that effort is through our um, reconnaissance monitoring. So 
unlike our extensive data sets in the eight watersheds, uh, the reconnaissance monitoring is just a low intensity, just one storm event sampling in as many watersheds and catchments around the Bay Area as possible. We're just trying to get a sense of whether a catchment is highly polluted or not. And uh, this map shows the sites that we had up, in, up until or through water year 2016. And a lot of these drainages uh, or sites that we sampled um, ultimately flow into the priority margin units that we're interested in. But you'll notice here's San Leandro Bay. We don't have much information going into the San Leandro Bay. So we have had lots of sites on our sampling list um, from the San Leandro Bay that we are interested in sampling. The challenge with these sites is that they are all in very tidal areas. And um, this is true for a lot of sites that we are interested in, right? Because as Phil mentioned, 40% of the old industrial areas within one kilometer of the bay, a lot of that's gonna be tidal. So sampling tidal sites is challenging, it's possible. Um, we just have to get the stars to align a little bit. Um, to ensure that we're sampling stormwater, we have to make sure, we have to sample when a storm is hitting at the same time that we have a low tide. And in these sites, we needed a very, very low tide. So we tracked every storm in water year 2015, didn't happen. We tracked every storm in water year 2016, stars didn't align. Finally, we got it in 2017. We got two storm events, December 15th, February 9th. Um, we deployed three teams in those two storms and we, we got samples at all six sites. It was uh, something we're, we're pretty proud of. So what does this look like? Well, um, the data that we got shows is shown here. The particle ratios are the top number for each of the watersheds and the, the water concentrations are right below. And this is all preliminary data. Um, but what it does help point, point out is like, we've got a really big screamer here compared to the others. Um, we've got some moderately warm sites here. And then we've got a couple that don't appear to have much PCB slowing out of them, um, at least in the storms that we captured. So um, this is the kind of information that we're providing to stormwater managers to help them know um, where they might look in this whole drainage area to go find source properties and change the margins. So story number two. Uh, this is measuring mercury loads from the Guadalupe River into the lower South Bay. And this re story requires just a little setup. So I'm going to take us back 15 years uh, when uh, the RMP first started monitoring the Guadalupe River. And this is the discharge or flow in the Guadalupe for the whole season. And right here, this event is, um, it was the second event we monitored, and it's a one in five year storm event. So that is a quite a large event in the second, the second storm ever. Um, the team led by Lester McKee at that time uh, sampled that event for five straight days. And this is a closer look at the, at the flow um, and then the mercury samples, the actual concentrations there in red or orange. And um, you can see that the concentrations got, got up to around 7,000 nanograms per liter here on this end. That's really, really pretty high. And um, of course that's because the Guadalupe River drains the New Almaden mercury mine. And if you've heard Lester talk, you know these stats. The New Almaden mercury mine drains or had, um, produced 40 million, wait, that sounds like a lot. Let me check my notes. 40 million kilograms, could that be? 40 million kilograms of mercury during its working life. I, have, I, I sometimes face out when Lester talks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's not here. <laughs> anyway, what's that? Right, right. Okay, but, but I do know it's 30% of the North American production and 6% of the global production. So it's a lot of mercury. Um, and, uh, and then the Guadalupe River has its own mercury TMDL, which um, uh, therefore the river has been monitored for many years since water year 2003. So this is a graph showing the loads, the total mercury loads for each water year um, 
between 2003 and since. Um, I will say, uh, not, not showing it, but I will say that water year 2003 was not a particularly large water year. Um, it just got that one really big storm event. And, and so it had a massive mercury export, over 100 kilograms, and um, that's over 10 times the allowable load for the Guadalupe River, which is 9.4 kilograms based on the TMDL. All these other years, the, the monitored ones are in orange, the, the estimated ones are in blue. Um, they've all been very useful uh, for, for our understanding of Guadalupe tran or mercury transport through the Guadalupe River. Um, but clearly the remaining data gap is, is with these large rare storm events like the one that happened in water year 2003. So, Beginning, beginning in 2016 when we had uh, no monitoring on the books for that year, but there was an El Nino forecast, uh, we decided to create a contingency plan for monitoring in case a big event happened. Through discussions with uh, stakeholders, we came up with mobilization criteria um, that we knew if, if these uh, played out, it would lead to a, a mercury export event. And those criteria came to fruition in early January of this year. Um, I want to send out a huge shout out to the RMP Steering Committee. Um, they quickly reviewed the information that we put forward in early January. Um, probably some of them were still on vacation. And, uh, and they turned around a decision uh, allowing us to mobilize for this event and release those contingency funds. So thank you, um, because it was quite a fun event. Um, this graph here shows the flow in the river um, during that event, we did an eight-day sampling campaign, and the green dots are where we collected, when we collected a mercury sample. It's not a concentration. And I want to try to, try to give you a sense of uh, our experience um, in this storm because uh, I know that's something that we can't really relay in a report. Um, but here in, at this purple dot, we collected a blank. Um, you can see what the river looked like. This is actually storm flow, but, um, but it's just lower flow. Moving on up the hydrograph, uh, you can see a lot of that veg is now inundated. And uh, there's a pedestrian path on the far side that's now starting to um, get some water on it. We saw a number of people come down the pedestrian path and then have to turn around. Um, and then here is the peak. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that it's so dark. I, I really am sorry that it was so dark. I wish that it, these things happened during the daytime, but they tend to happen at night. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that's what it looked like. It was totally covering the pedestrian path, and um, it, was, it was really, really quite amazing. So we had a remote team working in conjunction with a sampling team. The, that remote team was constantly monitoring the forecasts, the flows, um, everything around the region. You should, Lester was going crazy because everything was so exciting. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was really a very memorable experience. And um, just to give you a feel for the very moment of the peak or, or right around the moment, um, this is my colleague, Sarah, saying, Lester, it's, it's amazing right now. And, um, and it, it really was. It really is doing this kind of work um, getting to watch these creeks and rivers just roar to life and then recede again, it's very special. Um, definitely, this was one of my highlights of my career, and I know something that Lester had been waiting for for 14 years. So, total flow for that storm event was over half of the average annual runoff in the Guadalupe River. Um, during this one storm series, 70 kilograms of mercury were flowed through the Guadalupe River, which is uh, more than seven times the allowable load, according to the TMDL. Um, as compared to that 2003 storm, the, the pattern of concentrations are a bit different, and that has to do with the antecedent rainfall conditions in the watershed, but the concentrations got up to very similar um, between the two storms, and all of this is detailed in the report that's now up on the RMP website. An interesting analysis uh, that I, I thought was interesting was um, that the proportion of um, flow from the mining district 
explained 88% of the variability in mercury concentration. So, you know, clearly, this is not the only pathway for mercury in the Guadalupe River, but it's definitely the most important. So, uh, an important data gap that we have is still, uh, that we still have, is what happens after the big event? What happens in the next events? So in 2003, um, this was the big event that I was showing you. And here you can see concentrations remained really high. In fact, note I had to add a secondary y-axis because concentrations got up to almost 20,000 nanograms per liter. In 2017, we had several large flow events, really large. This one's even bigger than, than the one we monitored. What might have happened with mercury flowing down the river during these events is, is still a question mark. So looking back at this graph, adding on the 2017 uh, load just for the one event, um, you can see that the, the one event really eclipses all the other years uh, since water year 2003. And um, I want to show you the the annual flows. These are the annual flows in the Guadalupe River since the record began in the early 30s. And it's hard to see, but this line points to water year 2003, a very mediocre year. 2017, on the other hand, was one of the largest flows on record. So um, it's hard to say exactly how much mercury came down the river uh, in 2017, but we estimate that possibly over 500 uh, kilograms. So for Guadalupe River, the mercury story uh, and the mercury story, we definitely have to take the long view um, with our monitoring strategy, but we also have to be completely prepared and ready to go when the big event happens. So a parting thought, um, now that my stories are over. Um, so as we're approaching the 2018 sampling season, we're, uh, we're getting geared up, we're getting excited, but I do have to remind myself that many years and many parts of every year, this is, this is how we're feeling. But once in a while, we are, uh, we're lucky enough to get this. <laughs> and when we do, I want to tell you, we're ready. We're ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. All right, now Don Yee is going to bring this home, and I just want to uh, our MIT grads, and their uh, mascot is engineers, so I think we can all say, go engineers. <laughs> um, we'll just play along with that. Uh, Don joined us at the I-99, and he's worked on projects including atmospheric deposition of contaminants, surveys of pollutants that aren't always monitored by the RMP, coring of samples, as Diane found out earlier. And a precursor to Don's topic today, uh, investigations of PCB loads from watersheds and point source dischargers. Am I on? OK, thank you. OK. Thank you, uh, and I'd like to thank my collaborators on this work, um, Jay, Alicia, and Lester. Um, we'll call them the Priority Margin Unit, uh, working on Priority Margin Unit. So once upon a time, there was a TMBL, and TMBL needed some predictions of what would happen if we managed it. And thus was born. The whole bay one box model. So we looked at different things, inputs of PCBs coming into the bay, mixing and other processes inside the bay. And as you see, they're fading, hopefully degradation and burial and hopefully gone forever. But, you know, we also worry that maybe that's not the end of the story. Um, certainly PCBs are leaving the system, but, you know, like a bad horror movie, possibly PCBs could come back from the grave. But of course, this model is kind of a real simplification. The whole bay isn't just one giant bathtub or a box or anything like that. So thus was born conceptual model version 2.0. Oh. 
So again, we think about the same things, thinking about, you know, dividing the bay up into smaller portions, looking at inputs, mixing processes, and exports. Um, you know, and, and with the primary margins unit, we're, we're focusing on really sub embayments you know, or sub sub embayments smaller parts of them. And so in the in the delirium, I came up with a poem. And so this ad infinitum part, although it's nice, the modelers like to think about that really you know, you run out of a whole lot of things, resources, basically. And so, for these areas, these priority margin units, um, they were previously known as uh, highly regarious after a copyright dispute. Um, we went by that. And they're high in a number of things, loading, concentrations, biological impact, is Still mentioned uh, plan management action and hopefully a uh, recovery. So one of the study areas, of course, mentioned previously, San Leandro Bay is basically the area between Oakland Bay Farm Island near Oakland Airport and uh, Alameda. Um, highly enclosed, uh, it's an urban area, a lot of older urban um, infrastructure, and we previously studied it. Um, Dom et al. did a study in 98 and wrote it all up in 2000. It also happens to be where we used to hang out. SFDI's offices were there until 2011. So concentrations in 98 uh, were very highly variable. Um, you know, high in a number of spots. I have an arrow. Yeah. Uh, Oh, there we go. So you can see up in some of the smooths, very high concentrations. And then some of the areas where you see exactly concentric circles are the cores. And in most of those cores, similar to the wetland core that uh, was shown earlier, the, the very surface is, is often a little bit lower, and, and the deeper layers were, were often the maximum concentrations. So out of that, we do. Uh, PCB mass budget for San Leandro Bay. So what would that do? I was thinking of doing a bumper sticker, but it's too cryptic and I need a bigger car. And actually that car is smashed now, so it's, I might have an opportunity. It's similar to a Bay 1 box model where we just say, okay, well, let's just pretend San Leandro Bay is uniform. Um, and we use daily average rates uniform mixing, all the assumptions that we did for the one bay, uh, one box model for the open bay. Um, we did some adjustments for local parameters. Um, for example, the ambient sediment concentrations, which we got from the DOM study. Uh, watershed loads that Alicia and, and Gang worked on. And, and then we got some external uh, PCBs from adjacent open bay that's also coming into the system. And we uh, got some help doing some tidal flows so again, you know, same general idea. Treat San Leandro Bay as one box and go through all the processes that we thought about for the whole bay uh, in past budget. So for, uh, like I mentioned before, we got some help with um, the water flows um, from Rusty and crew. You'll hear from him later today. We asked them to kind of slap together a quick uh, a water budget for the region. And you can see that um, clearly, you know, even just based on, on the flows of water, that it's not uniform, the, the speeds of the water traveling vary quite a lot within the region. So clearly, you know, the one box may be not exactly right, but maybe it'd be negligible because we're caring about decadal time scale. So, you know, even though on like a, you know, meters per second or whatever basis, um, sediment moves at different speeds. Um, that maybe in the long term things spread out enough that it doesn't matter. So here's a picture of tidal flows into uh, San Leandro Bay, kind of summarizing everything that Rusty did. Um, and you notice that most of the flows are coming in from the north, um, about half as much coming in from the west side. And the outflows are very interesting that it's very asymmetric. So almost nothing goes out um, to the west, the bay farm, and 
everything heads out to Oakland Harbor to, uh, to the north. And then there are some exchanges back and forth across the middle section, but overall there's kind of net motion from, from the uh, west side getting up and out uh, to the north. So uh, again, we have PC boy storm loads from from the watersheds group. Um, at least this was before they actually sampled. So you know the timing is not right. So, so these these loads may be adjusted in the future. But uh, as of the time we were doing it, we were estimating about a kilogram per year going into San Leandro Bay. Um, and uh, as as mentioned before, we we did some studies in other water uh, watersheds where we look at how fast stormwater settled and, and you know you can either assume that either it all stays as kind of an upper bound or you know about half of it stays suspended test you know uh, like a few minutes or an hour um, so you might think of that eventually getting out of the San Leandro Bay uh, just on the tide. Um, inputs from the west side actually are not totally negligible um, Calculated out across the year, even though you know it, it's not coming in at very high concentrations, it's going in all the time. And so the tidal input to PCBs from the Central Bay are actually about a quarter as big as, as coming in from the watershed. So it's not negligible and will affect what we see in the next slide. So here's the PCB mass budget. Um, we did a variety of assumptions. So at the top here, we assumed that, okay, what if the sun concentration in San Leandro Bay was 200 nanogram per gram, and then we have, have, have uh, all the way down to 25 as a lower limit. Um, um, but what we found with, in the mass budget model was that no matter what our starting concentration, within about uh, around 20 years, we're pretty much at the same point. And that, Endpoint is driven by the balance of incoming watershed loads and 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 the inputs from the west side from from the open bay. So uh, from the DOM study, we estimated the average concentration in San Leandro Bay was around 125. So we'd be somewhere between that blue and green line. And you know here we are, you know about 18 years later. So you know. And if you had a five-year-old in your backseat ever, you know, get that question a lot. Are we there yet? Um, you know, we would predict that we should be around 35 nanogram per gram. So have we gone there? Well, thanks to a lot of pennies falling from heaven, uh, we managed to resample it recently. Um, and so we got to look at sediment, water, fish uh, in, in a number of sites, repeating a lot of the sites in, in the 98th study. And then we have some uh, some analyses done, for example, PCBs, and then some kind of pending, like the, the benthos identification and stuff, waiting for more money to fall from the sky. So here are the PCB concentrations. Um, you can see, well, maybe not see them that clearly in red. So the red circles are, are the results from 2016, done in a lot of the same spots that were done previously. And we see that PCBs are still high in San Leandro Bay in the open waters, as well as in the sloughs uh, this time around. Um, for a better look at a, a specific sites up close, we did a comparison of the raw data, uh, you know, face-off showdown to 98 and 2016. And we were shocked. 2016 beats 98. We were stunned. They were robbed, I think, right? <laughs> so. I'm just worried, gosh, are we going back in time? You know, uh, as the core showed, like the concentrations were higher in the past. So could we possibly be eroding and kind of getting back into kind of these dirtier sediments that, that were up at the surface in the, in the past? And then, you know, we, as, as we thought, one of these yogis had this deja vu all over again. We, we experienced a similar thing where we saw kind of what we thought was perhaps a trend in the data. Um, this was RMP data. And, and so you see, like, uh, between 03 and 05, it looked like uh, they, uh, concentrations of PCBs, and they were going down. And then suddenly, they jumped up on the right. And, you know, put your hands on your hips. And <laughs> so let's redo the time warp again. Um, 
as a result of that previous sounding, we, we did some further work with the lab and said, oh, okay, is there something going on methodologically? Methodologically, yes, with the analyses, and we find, yeah, maybe there is something. The extraction methods change over time, so uh, we did an adjustment. So we're adjusting 98 twofold uh, to account for sort of the differences in extraction between the time periods, even so, uh, 2016 is about level with the uh, 98 results. So it's like, wow, you know, our PCB is not leaving. How slow can these things leave the system? So like any earth shattering, you know, disappointment, you step back and write a memoir. And, well, you know, the models always tell, well, maybe they're, they're tired of this one, but, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, George Fox, very cute guy. Um, you know, obviously, we're, we're, part of the problem is that we're not using local data. You know, we're, we're trying to say, ah, okay, let's just use the data number as a first cut. And, you know, that's fraught with its, its own dangers. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, open water SSC, you know, maybe we're overestimating the net transport and mixing. Um, we're getting load estimates. At that time, we didn't have anything local for San Leandro Bay. So, you know, we're kind of taking regional averages, and regional averages means that you're, you're wrong in like 90% of the places, you know, but that on the whole region level, you get about right, but each individual one is individually wrong. Um, and then also we have kind of this, this oversimplistic, perhaps even within kind of these sub embayments, uh, they're sub sub um, and, you know, just looking at the, the data that we had from 2016, as well as 98, there's, there's also kind of an east-west divide, like the east side of San Leandro Bay is always higher than the west side for the most part. So we might have to think about, you know, if, if we're going to model a uh, smaller subunit. So just to convince ourselves that we're not totally nuts, I just tweak some things on the model. Same starting point, 125 nanogram per gram. Our base model is the yellowish greenish line. And so we said, okay, what if we got our SSC wrong about by a factor of two? That's the dark blue line. Uh, what if we estimate our tidal flows wrong? Um, again, you know, you, you end up with a, a higher final concentration than you would uh, under our base case assumption. So yes, very big assumptions that, that are fraught with dangers. So we even had some data that suggests maybe, you know, our, our model SSC was a little bit off. You know, we, we took a few grab samples. In reality, you really want long-term uh, measurements of SSC or turbidity uh, across months, across you know, tidal flows, spring neap tides, big storms, little storms, everything in between. But even just from a few grabs, we see that uh, we probably overestimated by about 15 to 20%. That's not going to get us all the way there. So, of course, the other thing that, that we have really big uncertainties on is the load. So, um, here we see that if the watershed loads were about four times what we estimated from that regional model, that basically you would get a case where you indefinitely stay at the concentration that we did it in 1998. Uh, just to convince ourselves again that we're not totally nuts about that. This was before Alicia and crew went out sampling. Um, this was a survey done by consultants looking at the section of Damon Flu, which is just upstream of 880 near the Oakland Coliseum. And they looked at sediment concentrations in the banks around the area. And, you know, certainly there's a lot of concentrations above 100. And then, um, you know, if we do you have some questions about, uh, you know, the extraction methods or whatever. It might even be higher than that. So back to this symbol. It's not totally meaningless. It was made with some thought. I mean, basically, this is a model of essentially this is large inputs, very large inputs of PCs in the past led to a large inventory in San Leandro Bay. And then there were some exports kind of keeping it uh, going totally out of control, um, but going to the open bay. Uh, what we may find ourselves in the current situation is that uh, inputs are somewhat reduced from past, but we still have a fairly big inventory, and that the inputs are roughly balancing the exports. 
and hopefully in the future we can choke off the input and the inventory will shrink and gradually family and bay as well as the other margin units will improve. So have we learned anything from all this? Well, 20, hindsight is 2020. Ounce of prevention is worth, uh, I did it for family and bay, two, 22 tons of cure. Uh, don't wait until this is a Reinerism. Don't, well, he got it from somewhere I'm sure too. Don't wait until the horse uh, has left the barn to bolt it. Uh, and of course, given that it's moving so slowly, it, maybe it's a tortoise. And then uh, another thing that Reiner, you know, he, he made an impact. He was there when I started. So, you know, turn off the faucet beyond before mopping off the floor. And really, you know, we're talking about the dirty sites in the watersheds and the sloughs. And, you know, eventually, hopefully, San Leandro Bay will be clean. And here's a lovely shot of San Leandro Bay. <laughs> Oh, but this is the time to ask the panel uh, anything you'd like about these last three. Uh, Alicia, when you showed the two time series from the 2002 storm and the 2017, your maximum um, load and your maximum concentration was the lag in 2002 and and not in 2017. I mean, that just stuck right out. Do you have any idea what that might be? Yeah, I mentioned it, but I didn't go into it. So there was a real difference in the end seed and rainfall that had, was, that was leading up to the December 2002 or water year 2003 storm event. And so you saw um, in the concentrations, I don't know if you remember, I guess it went this way. It took a while um, before those concentrations started rising. And that's, uh, it also has to do with something that you can't see in just the hydro, oh, I'm sorry, and then in water year 2017, the concentrations kind of went like this, and that's because um, there was already quite a lot of rainfall that had happened and a lot of saturation up in the watershed. The other thing that you can't see in just the flow hydrograph is what's happening up in the mining district and the rainfall and the intensity of rainfall that's happening up there. But when I, later I showed a graph that showed the relationship between mercury concentrations and the proportion of flow emanating out of the, the mining district, and that has a very, very good correlation. So, um, but that's something that's not evident in the hydrograph. Does that answer your question? Okay. I have a question over here. Um, this is probably for Don and Alicia. Maybe, maybe Jane even has some thoughts on it. Um, and it it uh, it has to do with the importance of sampling those tidal sites and you know I've been involved in the decisions about you know that this is an important area and you mentioned that it's tough to get those Goldilocks conditions where you can go sample it and you're you're sampling what you think is stormwater but what and I think that it's really important to you know continue to look for ways to do this the concern is and, and I, it's it's something that we just have to grapple with I don't think it's like a showstopper is that if you want to use those data for something more than just kind of indicating a, a sense of degree of contamination, like in a particle ratio, but if you want to use them for loads, then you have to confront the possibility that some of the material that you're measuring has been, you know, convected up tidally, and that you're just, you know, so you're getting a little bit of a of a skewed picture or biased picture about what would be the load from that area. And so this is, and Phil mentioned this in his talk, that there's so much of the industrial area that's within, you know, a, a short distance of the shoreline, and that's where a lot of our, you know, his legacy contaminants are. So I think that this is, should be kind of like, a, a, you know, a strategic area to develop techniques and an intellectual framework for how to sort out the data for use in loads in the future. Do you want to say anything? I have things. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think Richard's point is, is spot on. And um, just to, <clears throat> just to clarify, the, the reconnaissance style monitoring, which is just one storm event, um, and, and Richard knows this, but we're not pretending that we can take that data 
and scale up and have a really good estimate of loads based on that one data point. Um, to, to, to do a loading study and really try to understand the average load coming out of a watershed, you have to sample many times over. The recon style of monitoring is just to give some indication of whether a watershed is highly polluted or not. And we've done a lot of analysis on those, um, those other eight watersheds with intensive data sets to, that suggests that um, we can sample once, maybe twice if we're afraid of a false negative, and, um, and have a good sense whether a watershed is really polluted, not polluted at all. Um, it's the tweeners that are a little bit challenging, but, um, but we grapple with those and, and try to work with that. But, but yeah, to, to get into loads out of those areas, we will have to further develop our, our techniques. Done. Yeah. So, so I'll, are are we on to the next question, or should I, I think address my? Yeah. I think thinking about it, um, you know, Richard's question. I'm I'm thinking to a certain extent. Yes, it, it, loads itself is very challenging, but um, the tidal areas themselves are are going to kind of respond in the, the similar way that the PMU does, so that even if we don't get loads perfectly that maybe we can kind of see progress in, in concentrations coming out uh, or sloshing back and forth in those loops and, and use that as kind of like a, a reality check that at least we're heading in the right direction, even if we don't get the quantity exactly right. Hey, Don. That's Chris. Um, so if I have the numbers you presented right, it looks like the sources about one kilogram of PCBs are coming into, roughly, are coming into San Leandro Bay. Right. That's about 5% of the estimated load for all PCBs coming into the bay from stormwater, which is a lot um, for that small little drainage area. Mm -hmm. So um, I know there's work going on from a management standpoint in those watersheds. Can you speak to, you know, the PMU study is only for a short period of time to kind of build this conceptual model, but I'm Maybe you can speak to what's next as far as monitoring recommendations moving forward to evaluate the reductions that hopefully occur from a relatively large source, it looks like, um, from those watersheds. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I touched on, on that in my response to Richard as well. It's like, okay, so whatever loads of monitoring you do, um, you know, you can look at concentrations on particles and things. Are, are we making any dent in, in this? kind of, um, it'll be mixed signal, uh, but it's more source influence. So, you know, you would think that that would respond the quickest of all if, if anything's going to respond. Um, and then, as I mentioned to Diane, you, you certainly could say, okay, you know, at some point in the future, I'm going to take a call here and just say, hey, is my surface sediment a net improvement? Um, you know, it's, it's not quite the hard number inventory, TMDO load kind of answer, but it does tell you qualitatively, you know, whether or not you've made a dent or, or heading in the right direction. Okay, any other questions? Going, where is one? Oh, Jen. Yes, I have a question. Um, it's actually um, to the down. I think uh, there's a one slide you actually showed um, no matter what is the input to the model, you know, you end up after 20 years on the same spot. So if I interpret it correctly, so I wonder when does that mean perhaps that should the model is not really sensitive to the input that's on the technical side. But the bigger things, it seems like it says no matter what you do or do not something that does not matter because after 20 years, it's going to end up on the in place. So I think it's a pretty okay. proactive, like, yeah. it's like how I read those slides, I feel like, oh. No, 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 so, that's sort yeah. of like the opposite sort of conclusion. So, so, <laughs> so the, the reason why it, it went to the same one from whatever starting concentration um, in the ambient segment was that we, we got our loads possibly wrong, maybe the model kind of wrong. But that, that line is, is preset by what, are, what you're defining as your watershed loads and your bay loads. And, you know, it doesn't matter what your starting point is. Eventually, all that sediment gets mixed, covered, exported, and arrives at exactly the balance point for calling your input. So if you change your input assumption, that line moves. Like the, the case where I showed four, four times higher watershed loads. 
maybe that was our main mistake. Maybe our real loads are four times higher or two times higher combined with, you know, bad SSC. And that, you know, means that we should actually expect ourselves to be where we were in 98, right? So. Okay, thanks. 